Welcome to Circles Live. Welcome back on a Monday evening. You are in the right place if you are hungry to grow and humble to learn. If you are wanting to be that pioneer of the faith. In other words, somebody who is going to use the uniqueness of how they've been created to carve that unique pathway to make an impact and have influence on the earth for the kingdom of heaven. Well, listen, I'm so glad that you're joining us. And if you were with us last week, you know that we started on a particular aspect of the Sermon on the Mount, which of course was Jesus' manifesto. And we kind of took a little bit of a different twist on explaining the Sermon on the Mount, and particularly the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes forms the first part of Jesus' manifesto. A manifesto, of course, is what a government, a government or a, a leader or proposed leader of a nation presents to its people and promises, you know, if I'm in power, then this is what I will deliver. But also in the manifesto, there's a set of responsibilities for the citizens of that nation. So, of course, the whole idea is that people need to play their part, the leaders need to play their part, and the leader or the king of a nation, if it's a kingdom, needs to play their part. And of course, Jesus came as the servant king. He came to reestablish the kingdom of heaven by reestablishing the connection between man and God by dealing with the sin issue and making the way possible for the kingdom of heaven to be manifest on earth. A different way of living, a better way of living, a way in which when we walk with God and work with God, we win for God. I mean, we all love to live a life where we feel like we're winning. And I believe that is God's design for our lives. That doesn't mean everything goes well or everything uh, goes smoothly. Far from it. In fact, this is where we go back into the Sermon on the Mount. Because really, Jesus doesn't hide the fact that there are going to be challenges. But the beauty of the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus said this, is that you're in the world, but you're not of it. So I'm going to teach you, Jesus says, through this manifesto of how you navigate that and how living in my kingdom, the unseen kingdom, the unseen realm, but living physically on this planet, how you can be different, how you can smile while others are struggling to smile, how you can rejoice when others are struggling to rejoice, how you can can still keep going when actually your circumstances suggest that you should start quitting. And so we looked at the, I guess the, the slightly, slightly uh, quirky take of looking at the, the, the Beatitudes as a buffet. And the wisdom that I gave was never eat before a buffet. And that's the kind of overarching kind of subtitle that I've given to my paraphrase of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, Jesus is talking about how we live spiritually. Because first and foremost, we have physical bodies, but we are spiritual beings. That's a really important point. We've talked about worldview in recent weeks and how really getting our worldview and f framed correctly. In other words, what I believe about myself, the world, about people, really kind of making sure we frame that correctly and according to God's word. You see, when I actually frame my life as I am a spiritual being in a physical body, that is different to the way the world sees it. The world sees, no, I'm a physical person and maybe they accept things of the spiritual nature. But first and foremost, it's about the physical, the material, but not in the kingdom of heaven. It starts from the spiritual, the unseen. And when we prioritize that, that actually that's what drives everything that is seen. That's why Jesus in Matthew 6, 33 said, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. In other words, the unseen realm of his kingdom. And all the other things that you have need of will be added to you. In other words, the physical realm responds and reacts to the spiritual realm, not the other way around. So we're going to dive back into the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. Let's just remind ourselves what Jesus said from Matthew 5 verse 1. And let's read a few verses to recap. So Jesus says this in Matthew 5 verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went upon the mountainside and sat down. And his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. 
He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in spirit, uh, pure in heart, sorry, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus sets out in these Beatitudes, the first part of the Sermon on the Mount and his manifesto. He sets out how to live from a position of being blessed. Now notice that position of being blessed is emphasized as the first word in each of those lines of this first part of the manifesto. Because being blessed is a state. It is a position. It is not subject to the external. Jesus is saying in his kingdom, the, the, the question of whether I am blessed or not is not in question. I am blessed. Now, whether I see myself as blessed, whether I feel blessed, whether I would describe my circumstances as blessed, that's another question. But as far as Jesus is concerned, he's saying, people in my kingdom, they are blessed. Remember, the state of the citizens of a kingdom are connected to the reputation of the king. I mean, it wouldn't look good on a king for his citizens and subjects to be downtrodden, downhearted and disappointed and feeling disenfranchised. That doesn't look good. Like what looks good in a nation and a kingdom is when the people are prospering because the king is prospering in his leadership and his governance. And so Jesus is saying here, in my kingdom, my people are blessed. But the reason they're blessed looks different than the way the world sees blessed. Because again, the world sees blessed based upon the outside in. Blessed is based upon the physical, the seen. Whereas in the kingdom of heaven, blessed is a position that you hold and then you bring that position to life, okay? And, and I use the analogy of the buffet because, uh, and the, the kind of title that we've given it here is never eat before a buffet because the best position to be in when you're going to an all-you-can-eat buffet where there's quality of food and a quantity of food is hungry. You don't want to go there when you are fed and you've stuffed yourself full of McDonald's or some takeaway food and yet you've gone and there's this quality food and you're just like, I wish I had the space. It's good to be hungry when you know you've got access to much. Well, the kind of second point we're going to jump into is the second line, because we looked last week at blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now we're going to look at verse four, which is where Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, the way I want to explain this is, let's go back to the buffet analogy. And, and there's lots of wisdom here for when you are next at a buffet. In fact, I think as a result of this series on Monday nights, I think we're all going to be looking to go and eat at buffets to test this wisdom, to show ourselves as the, the wise person in the buffet scenario. Well, here's a bit of wisdom. And those of you who are good buffet eaters, who know the good buffet etiquette, you know this. And here's the point. Fill your plate selectively. Fill your plate selectively. Now, you see, if you go to an all-you-can-eat buffet, and we've established last week that, you know, never eat before a buffet because the need will, will match the, the provision and that combination is a winning combination. But here's the thing. If you're not careful, you can just, as soon as you're there, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm so glad I didn't eat. And you just dive in to eat whatever you can get your hands on because you just think it's going to go. And you're just like, I just, I just need to feed myself. But have you ever been at a buffet where you've filled your plate and you've already made your way through most of that food and you've already started to fill that, that hunger and that hole that you had in your stomach? And you're getting full. In fact, you might be full. And then somebody walks past you and they've got something on your their plate that you never saw. 
that you went and got trifle for dessert, but they're walking past with chocolate fondue. Chocolate fondue with a mass of, of marshmallows and fruit. I mean, who loves a bit of chocolate fondue? Oh, yeah. So, you, but you're like, oh, I can't believe it. I went and just grabbed the trifle. I was more focused on getting filled with something rather than getting filled with what is best. I wasn't selective in my choice. I'm, I've got no room left for the chocolate fondue. And you're kind of, you're disappointed. You're like, oh, I should have chosen that. Have you ever done that? Go on, hands up, be honest right now. You're like, I, I jumped too soon. <laughs> I jumped too soon. I didn't hold myself back. If that's you, well, listen, make notes. You should be making notes next time you're at a buffet. Okay. In fact, when we pull our circles together, uh, wherever you're having a, your circle, listen, let's, let's do, let's have a season of all you can eat buffets just to purely out of applying these principles out of a spiritual lesson, of course, nothing to do with the fact that we just love a buffet. So fill your plate selectively. Now, why am I saying this? Coming back to this verse, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. When somebody is in a state of mourning, it's because they've lost something or someone. We've been looking at this recently in our broadcasts about how we deal with grief and loss. Now, the reality is, is that loss is part of life. Like loss is going to happen. It's not if it happens, it's when it happens. But what Jesus teaches us here is that there are two dials, okay? And there are other places that Jesus teaches us. And now let me give you a couple of verses just to show that this is not just me kind of making something out of, you know, just this verse. Because it's important when we look at scripture that we we interpret it and we, we, we understand it through the lens of, of, of the whole teaching and the whole uh, scripture. So you know, Jesus talks about in Matthew 16, verse 26, he says, What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? You know, what Jesus is saying there is, is that if you turn up the gain dial on the wrong things, then you're going to turn the lost dial, because they're connected, you're going to turn the lost dial up on the things that really matter. You know, if you, let me use an, an analogy. If, if I believe that my worth is attached to my career and the levels that I can achieve, and, and, and I might be reaching some of those levels. So the gain dial is going up. I'm gaining promotion. I'm gaining kudos. I'm gaining credibility. I'm gaining a reputation. But, but because I'm driven by the wrong motivation, actually, I'm going to be losing. My relationships are going to suffer because I'm going to be out of kilter. I, I'm going to be pursuing to fill a need that actually... It's not going to get met and I'm going to over, overstretch myself. I'm going to take on too much because actually the gain dial is being turned up in, in this area. But actually I'm going to be losing because the two dials are connected. Jesus is saying if you turn up the dial to try and, uh, 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 to try and gain the whole world, then, then you are going to forfeit your soul. That dial is going to go down. And so... What else did Jesus say? Matthew 10, 39. Whoever finds their life, Jesus says, will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Look at what Jesus says. If you go and turn up the dial in finding your own life, then you're going to lose. The lose dial goes at the same time, the opposite way. You're going to miss out on what I have for you. But if you turn up the lost dial, okay? In other words, if you lose for my sake then the gain dial goes up. In other words, you're going to gain what I have for you. We have these two dials that are connected. <laughs> just a, a little analogy. One of the things that really frustrates me, and let's just find out if anybody else has maybe got this slight bit of OCD that I have. If anybody wears a hoodie, how many of you need to have, if you have those kind of um, strings that come down, okay, that kind of 
obviously kind of help with the hood. Uh, you have to make sure there are equal levels, yeah? Uh, because if you pull the string one way, one's really long, one's really, really short, and, and, and you know that if you pull one, the other moves, yeah? And so the idea, of course, is to balance them out. Because if you pull one, the other gets shorter. One gets longer, one gets shorter. It's the same the other way around. If I pull the other one, then that one, get longer, that one gets longer, that one gets shorter. In other words, it's like the two, two dials that are connected. When I turn the gain up on one, I turn the other dial, uh, the lost dial, um, up as well. And so what we've got to understand here is, okay, well, if, if gain and loss are a part of life, how do I make sure I turn loss up correctly so that I gain the right things, rather than turning the gain up on the wrong things and losing out on what is better, okay? We know with Martha and Mary, Martha was, uh, is it Luke chapter 10? Martha was busy with many things. She was gaining a sense of, of maybe gaining a sense of uh, achievement from doing lots of things. In other words, the gain was up. But Jesus says, look at Mary. You know, she's chosen what is better. Martha, you're anxious about many things. In other words, your gain in one area is turning up the, the, the lost dial in another. But Mary has chosen to reject the busyness. In other words, to lose the busyness. And by losing the business, the gain dial on what, on what is truly important goes up. It's all about loss and gain. Now, what, why, why is that connected here? Because Jesus is saying, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who experience loss. In other words, you're blessed when the loss dial goes up. But why is that? Well, it comes back to the buffet. Blessed are you when you're hungry because there's food. Blessed are you when you experience loss because that creates an opening for the comforter who is the Holy Spirit. You see, the process of repentance is a process of loss. It's when I mourn over my sinful nature, the way I have been, the attitude that I have, the things that I've believed about myself, about others, about God. And actually, that's why repentance is not something we should avoid, because repentance is actually going in search of what I need to lose. So because I understand if I lose the right things, I'll gain the right things. If, if I gain the wrong things, I'll lose the right things. And so in that moment of repentance, in that moment of mourning, it is a, a beautiful moment because even though there's a mourning over who I once was, actually there's a rejoicing and a comfort because of who I am becoming. That's why Paul talks about the fact that, you know, there is this a crucifixion of the flesh and the resurrection of the spirit in us. We carry both the death and the resurrection, the two dials. The crucifixion is the losing, the resurrection is the gaining. And, and so it's so important that we understand that if I make something that is external to me, my source, then, then, then when I experience loss, it's going to be bad news because suddenly I'm going to lose my supply. But when I recognize that actually I might lose my supply through losing something or someone, a relationship ends, I may lose a loved one, I may lose a job or, you know, lo loss happens. And I may lose a supply of love, affection, or a sense of achievement, or validation, or whatever. I might lose a supply, but I do not lose a source. There's a difference between losing a supply and losing a source. And repentance is a constant recognition that actually I need to be making my source my priority. I need to be making my source the priority and the, the Holy Spirit comes into those moments where we are in a state of repentance, where we are coming before God saying, God, I, I, I need to change. Help me to see right now by illuminating, by the, the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, what is it? Put your finger on the area where I need to turn the dial up in terms of loss. In other words, I need to lose something for your sake, God, 
because by losing something for your sake, I experience something of depth and a measure of something that is beyond comprehension in the comfort of the person of the Holy Spirit. I experience something that no money can buy, no experience can buy, no person can bring to my life. This is something so deeply spiritual that I experience it, but only through the gateway of loss. Loss is the gateway to the gain in the kingdom. That's why Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. We shouldn't just mourn as a reaction to what we lose. We should actually go in search of loss because it is the gateway to gain. I know this is maybe challenging the way that we think We think as human beings because we've got to see ourselves first and foremost as spiritual. Isaiah 66 verse 2, the prophet says this, These are the ones that I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit, who tremble at my word. In other words, those who come with that sense in which I am nothing without God, humble and contrite in spirit, who are, are hungry to, to find what is of true value. And we find that through loss. 2 Corinthians 7.10, Paul says, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret but worldly sorrow brings death. What's he saying? He said, well, worldly sorrow, when I put all my eggs in the basket of the supply chain, of my relationships, of my reputation, of my career, and when I put my eggs in that basket and make the supply my source, when that's cut off, it brings death. But when you make the source of God, the Holy Spirit, your comforter, your supply, then it leaves no regret. You can suffer loss externally, but not regret the choice that you have made in prioritizing God and his kingdom. And so, you know, I could keep on going. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When we identify in the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, we have to understand that Jesus Christ died for us. He died as us so that Christ could become us and live through us. We are in this constant uh, metamorphosis of becoming like Christ from one degree of glory to another. But we only unlock those levels of glory through choosing to turn up the lost dial. What do I need to lose next for you, God? Now, it's a strange question, isn't it? But it's a question that any MVP, any hungry, humble follower of Christ is asking. Paul said, I, I consider everything rubbish compared to knowing Christ uh, 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 and, and in his sufferings, in order that I may know him in his, in his glory. In other words, the gateway to gain in the kingdom is through the doorway of loss. I could keep going, but I'm going to leave you with a question right now to discuss. And it's another brutally honest question that we must answer if we're going to really get anything out of it. And the question is this, what am I fighting to keep that I need to let die? What am I fighting to keep that I need to let die? What area of my life do I need to repent from and to heal? Because it's only when I repent from it, I will experience the comfort and the healing. How could allowing God access to forgive and heal me impact how he can use me going forwards? You see, the work that God is doing in you is connected to the work that God is going to do through you. If we increase the work that he does in us, we can increase the impact that he can achieve through us. Well, I hope this has been challenging. I've been, listen, I've been challenged <laughs> by preparing this. I want to get hungry to start turning up the lost dial because what I lose for his sake, I end up gaining what is of true value in the kingdom of heaven. And that makes me distinctive in this world to stand out, not so that I get the glory, but so that the glory of God is revealed through my life. And we may see more people drawn into the kingdom of heaven. Listen, remember today and every day, you are a champion and there's more inside of you than you think. 
Join me next time on Circles Live. Take care.